Nigerian President Bola Ahmed Tinobu has suspended the Minister uh, of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Elevation, uh, Dr. Beta Edu, over the allegations of fraud that were leveled against her. This development was announced in a statement by the President's Special Advisor on Media and Publicity, Ajuri Ngelali, as after Tinobu had ordered a probe into the suspended minister over a sum of 585 million naira being paid into a private account. Uh, the president's aide also says President Tinobu has directed the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission to thoroughly investigate the financial transactions of the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Poverty Alleviation. Well, to help us examine this corruption allegation and reasons why humanitarian non-profit organization Action Aid Nigeria had to pull out of the National Social Investment Program, we have joining us right now the Country Director of Action Aid Nigeria, Andrew Mamedu. Thank you so much, Andrew, for joining us. Uh, talk to us about this uh, social investment program and why Action Aid had to pull out, and then what you make of uh, uh, all these allegations um, against uh, the Minister of uh, Humanitarian Affairs, who has now been suspended by her principal, uh, President Bola Tunbu. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, um, when the program was announced by the former president, uh, President Buhari, um, it was lauded across board by civil society and by various actors, um, contributing then 500 billion for social intervention, covering um, four areas. And um, with those four areas, um, we saw elements of it affecting, of course, the poor and vulnerable social protection program. It's what it is across the world. It is supposed to fill the gap between the very uh, the gap between the have and the have not. So it's a cushion for those that are under the, the, the ladder, how to um, help them, cushion them, uh, give them that soft, soft landing. And um, looking at the school feeding program, the G, the conditional cash transfer, and um, the uh, Empower Pro program. All of those were things that would affect citizens directly. And um, for us, as civil society, Action Aid, we led in the, the, the with, with working with government in designing a monitoring framework. Particularly, we spearheaded the development of a third party monitoring framework. And the reason that was for things like this, we we were looking at institutionalizing the program. You cannot have such a program without necessarily institutionalizing it. And so we, we had a third party monitoring where we were working directly with the office of the vice president. We we're working with um, um, then the senior special assistant to the president, uh, Miriam Wies. We had direct contact with her. And we had um, civil society organization caught across the 36 states and FCT, majorly monitoring how the fund is being used, it's being disbursed, who's getting what, the issues that were emanating. There were issues emanating in the beginning, the, the, the two same problems that we had. And basically, what we or issues that emanated were immediately brought on board um, at the steering committee because there was a steering committee that was set up for that purpose. And the steering committee dealt with the issues as at when they arose. We were happy with that arrangement. But of course, after a while, we thought that it was shifted from the major ideology that set it up. And um, we saw some element of politics at play in it. It was moved away from the vice president's office. It was moved into Ministry of Humanitarian. We were happy with that. We were going to still continue engaging with the, minister, with the Ministry of Humanitarian. But of course, we didn't get the level of support and openness from when it was in the vice president's office. And for us, our name was at stake because we were working with over um, 300 civil society organizations spread across um, the 36 state and FCT. Um, of course, action was not being paid by the government, just to put that on the table. The, uh, action was being, um, th this was being um, funded by, by Commonwealth Development Office, FCDO, that's um, defeat then. And um, basically, we went through the nooks and crannies, monitoring the program, raising issues. There were issues of accountability, issues of corruption by the cooks, the, the egg aggregator. Those kind of issues were emanating. Um, ghosts, um, workers in the jeep program, all of those. And they were dealt with as they arose. 
But when he shifted away from the office of the vice president and went to straight to, of course, the Ministry of Humanitarian, for system-wise, for structure-wise, ordinarily, that's it. that's a good idea. So you have a system that will be running it. Um, but it was not open. And that is the reason with most of our government's um, 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 initiatives today. So it starts very well. And after a while, you then see people then using it for, for, for private gains. Oh, so all right, we, yeah. We, so yeah, that, yeah. Then, that then, then, of course, made us say, okay, you know what? And that coincided with covid you know what, if we cannot have access to work directly and have impact in the monitoring and report what is happening there, then we'll then pull out. So that was how we pulled out of the program um, then, yes. Yeah, and so uh, it, we've come from that period now to this era where President Tunubu's own government uh, is saying it wants some sort of transparency within that sector and only for its minister to be caught within this web of allegations. Uh, what exactly is in that ministry that's made it pretty difficult for ministers to be able to function very well. Uh, because right from Sadia, Umar Farouk, uh, down to Better Edu, uh, these two ministers who are the only two that have uh, manned these ministries have been enmeshed in these allegations. Does it look like uh, it's an extension of the political pot for political parties to actually dip their hands into the candy? Is that what the humanitarian ministry looks like? Like it's a place where you could easily just move out some funds and push out to party members uh, easily without being uh, noticed. Okay, Sambu, thank you very much. I, I think we all know um, that the last speaker, the um, TUC president, when he was speaking, yeah, corruption is a major issue in the country. We, we all know that. And there are theories that it's been perpetrated. One of those ways is this one where funds are moved to private account, to individual account. And it's against the rules and regulation of the federal government. So there are clear clear, clear rules and guidelines to, to deal with those. So one of the ways corruption happens is funds moving from account to private account, and then the private, the private account then be the one to disburse it. It is, it, it, unfortunately, it is something that is, um, highly in practice. It's not just the minister. I'm sure if we investigate this further, we will see much more persons, much more approvals like this coming up. The thing is that we applaud the president for taking the step, being bold enough to take a step to in, 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 in tackling this. But what lesson are we learning from it? It is very simple. Like, like I mentioned, we work with over 300 local civil society organizations. And as action aid, our funding was coming from the federal government. I'm sorry, it was coming from them, FCDO. While the other local civil society we we're working with was being covered by the federal government. But we had a clear agreement. We said we would only give approval when the work has been done and the federal government credits the accounts of this civil society organization. We do not want them. They were like, let's send the money to you. No, we don't want the money sent to us. Send the money directly to each and every of these organizations, every month, every time they finish their work, we send you the report, then you're able to pay them as at when you, that, that transparency and accountability is there. So what happens, Sambo, is this. Clearly, when monies go into individual accounts, you hear of cases of transfer some of those monies to you. Sometimes they come back to you like, oh, we made a mistake, can you transfer back this to us? That money, when you transfer it back to them, of course, it's never going back to the, to the, to the government coffers. What it's supposed to be, it is, some things, things that are, you are not able to pay for directly into people's account, that is where you will be able to say you are transferring money to the accountant. But not in huge sums of money like, like we are seeing, even billions we paid into individual accounts in the, in the, in the, in the, for, for the purposes of the person um, expending it and coming back to retire it. For Cook, I'll give you an example. For the Cook across the country, all their account details is with the federal government. They are paid Across the country, they are paid directly from the accountant general's office to their account. So there is no middle man or woman in it. You talk the same thing about, about the um, cash transfer. Then the money goes directly or in cases where they don't have account, there are money agents, it goes to bank and they go there. There are ways of verification where they collect those money. But by then you are collecting huge sums of money into somebody's account that you have to then um, expend it and then retire for the government. Of course, that would breed corruption. 
talk about the constituency project we have today, talk about several areas and elements where you have such corruption taking places. So it's not peculiar. So let's not let's not have this is the first time it is happening. It's not peculiar to, to the Ministry of Humanitarian. There are Yeah, but uh, you, you haven't really answered my question. I, I was just asking, does it look like the humanitarian ministry has been created uh, under the APC, like a political pot where whenever party faithful loyalists and whatever needs some sort of money, they just go in there and, and dip their hands into it. Because Sadia Umar Farouk was treasurer of the uh, 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 APC during its formation and she was given that position and we all know how it ended. And now Betty, uh, uh, sorry, Betta Edu also happened to be the national woman leader of the APC before she was sent into that position and we can all see the allegations that are coming there, uh, out from there. So does it look like the APC has turned the humanitarian ministry into a, a, a sort of uh, honeypot uh, for servicing, uh, you know, certain people within the party? So that's my response, Samuel. What I'm saying is this. It's not peculiar to the Ministry of Humanitarian. So Ministry of Humanitarian is one. If you go to the CBN, CBN is there. So which one will be greater than the CBN? If you go to NMPC, there are levels of unaccountability happening across board in those kind of places. So wherever they have opportunity, wherever it, it, it is not a party thing. So it's about it's about it's not about APC. It's not about PDP. So in in, in one state is PDP, in another state is APC. So wherever they are able to set up a cash cow as politicians, they do that because that, let's 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 come back home. Better able bought form presidential form. For your third million naira, she also spent some money running around and doing some of those campaigns, and of course she was maybe rewarded by being given the. She stepped down for 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 President uh, Ahmed Tinubu during the, the the primaries, and maybe she was rewarded because of that by giving a ministerial slot. I don't see her salary in four years getting up to a hundred million naira. Not to talk of the other amount that she has uh, she has invested in all of this. So all the politicians, they look out for such opportunities, such cash cow that they would use. So the Ministry of Humanitarian is just one. So let's not just focus on it. Yet it is, it is the one that is in the limelight of the day. It is the one that we should be looking at. But we applaud the president. At least he was able to listen to Nigerians this time around and say, hold on, we call, let's call it and see. Let's investigate this and see. But we need to make sure that our eyes follow the money, follow the resources. It needs to be institutionalized. It's not about one-off situation. How do we prevent it in the future? How do we make sure that this kind of um, cash cows, like, like you call it, like we call it, these cash cows are dealt with? So let's not focus only on humanitarian. The, for me, I just want to correct you there yeah, very quickly. Biggest, those two will be the biggest that we need to start with and start focusing on those. How and where is our money going to in all of yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would just want to correct you very uh, quickly that uh, Better do never wanted to be president of Nigeria. Uh, but she's been, you know, the national woman leader before she got this uh, position. But as we try to round off this conversation, how much damage have these allegations against the previous minister and then the incumbent minister done to us as a country, especially our efforts to attract international relief for very poor Nigerians, people who really need this monies uh, to be able to uh, uh, put their lives together. How much damage has it made to our efforts going forward uh, when we go out there to want to seek relief, support from the UN or other international agency? Okay. Um, um, first of all, 30,000 naira minimum wage, of course, you know that 30,000 minimum wage will not do anything for us today. Um, you know that um, we know that um, um, Nigerians, a good number, nine, nine, um, over 90 million Nigerians are living in the poverty line. We know that these people are suffering. You go to communities, I'm sure you get calls. I get calls every day, even when I'm, I'm not around. I get calls every day for support. So we know that Nigerians require the support. So having a mechanism in place to support them is not a bad thing. It's a very good, it's a laudable idea. But how? Having individuals now coming to disrupt that whole plan, disrupt that whole process, I think that's where the, the challenge is. So for, for us, it is a big dent, a further dent 
a, 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 an issue of trust. So there's, there's trust deficit from, from Nigerians to the government. So this kind of actions further erode such trust. How do we get back the trust to the Ministry of Humanitarian? The good thing is that the, the president has said that we should look at how to reform that whole process. And for us as Action Aid, we are happy to work with the government to institutionalize a citizen-driven process, a data-driven process. So let's start with the cash um, the um, social register. How do we make sure that that register is up to date, the right people are there, and the funds are going directly? There is no middle person. The funds are going directly. And there are third-party monitors that are monitoring this process to have a framework that is nationalized. I'm at some point, we're trying to get a bill passed in the National Assembly to nationalize this process. So this is the right time to relook at all of this process, look at the institutional framework, setting up the social protection program, looking at the monitoring framework, looking at the accountability framework. It has to be citizen-led. It has to be citizen-driven. Would all maybe somebody blew the whistle? Somebody saw that that uh, memo and of course flagged it and it trended and of course people latched onto it. That's how the president knew it could have been another memo that nobody talked about and it would just passed and nothing would happen about it. But let's have a framework in place that would institutionalize that when institutionalized, it is it becomes the norm of how to respond to deal with issues of uh, accountability within the system. Let's not stop it. So I think I think that's a clear warning we need to put on the table. Let's not stop it. We don't throw away the uh, the baby with the bath. Yeah, but you haven't really answered my question, uh, Andrew. I just wanted yeah. to know what sort of uh, dent uh, uh, this will make in our efforts because I mean we always go out of uh, our country seeking international support here and there. I mean I've seen Saudi Arabia donating to us relief materials here and there, the UN and all of that. How much of a dent is this in such a way that when we go out there again, it could actually stop us from gaining the sort of much needed relief that we need for our people? Um, Sambu, I think it's, it's a, we, maybe we don't know how much. It, it is huge. Uh, I'll give you maybe two or three examples. Very One quickly, as to try to round off. Talk about, talk about investments. When you talk about investments, we go out to meet investors. You hear them tell you that we cannot come to your country because they are asking us from for bribe left right center these are investors we require to shore up our our foreign exchange our forex so that is one another one is you have the lake chad basin and um, of course the uh, recharging of the lake chad basin that requires about 50 billion dollars and as civil society we're already talking to international community on how they can come in but one of their major fear clearly speaking to heads of major um, um, country agencies in the country one of their major fear is the issue of corruption and the ability for them to so if they put down five billion ten billion as countries how are they sure that this fund will be used the right way so when they see such thing with the conditional cash transfer with the social investment program the level of corruption that has been exhibited of course it's, it says that you guys have so much resources. Your challenge is always corruption. We are not able to put more resources. So it reduces the amount of resources that are coming, come that is that we come into the country. But who, who loses at the end of the day? It is the citizens that are losing at the end of the day. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is Nigerians that are losing at the end of the day. It is the country that is losing at the end of the day. And that is why the president has got to prioritize the issue of corruption. Yeah. He's got to look at the strategy and see how he would work with citizens and civil society to make sure that this um, is nipped on the board and we have it dealt with going forward. Thank you. All, all right, Andrew, just before I let you go, very quickly, you are saying that President Tinubu's action calling for reforms of the humanitarian ministry is very good. Uh, it's welcomed. Uh, but at the end of the day, we'll still have to put another minister there. Or if this current minister is found not guilty and she's brought back to that ministry, someone will still have to man it. How do we put accountability uh, uh, mechanisms in place to ensure that one person cannot just uh, uh, do uh, issue as such a huge volume uh, or amount of money to uh, an individual or specific people without the system raising alarm, without any warning system? So a couple of things I've mentioned them along the way. The first one is we have to be able to say, let's get the right data. So you don't come and tell me, oh, we are giving 10 people. Who are the 10 people? 
I'm giving Amin, I'm giving a Mecca, I'm giving a Jiro, I'm giving. So to mention the 10 people you're giving money to, that's one. So data, that's the first thing. The second one is we have to use technology. Technology has moved. Do you think um, countries that are developed, Canada, UK, and, and you think that people don't want to be corrupt? Because the system checks meets you. That is what happens there. So if the system checks me, you, you, it minimizes. I'm not, we're not saying there are no corruption. There are, of course. But it minimizes it drastically. So how do we make sure that we use technology, we have the right system in place? So the president has called for uh, the, um, the looking at the whole system, the framework around it. So in setting up that framework now, how do we make it citizen-driven? Let it be in the hands of the people. Let the people be able to take a look and say, yes, this has gone, this has not gone. Yes, this has this has gone, and it went to this person, it, went, it didn't go to that person. And if first things come up, there's a mechanism that will trigger, trigger, trigger a response. Uh, uh, all right, uh, I'm afraid... Uh... Andrew okay. Mamedu, we don't have enough time, but you've already proffered a lot of solutions, and I'm very sure that the Nigerian government will be listening to some of the solutions you've proffered. We must thank you so much. Uh, Country Director of Action Aid Nigeria, Andrew Mamedu, joining us to take a look at all the issues uh, pertaining the uh, uh, ongoing saga in the humanitarian uh, ministry in Nigeria, and of course, some of the much needed reforms that will be necessary to ensure that the reforms being canvassed by President Bola Tinobu uh, sits well when eventually that ministry is reformed. Well, that's how it's been for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Do join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Goodbye and thank you for watching. I'm Somna Samu.